So we've reached the 1970s. In July of 1970, the Department of Health established a, or convened a meeting to discuss the problems of Australia antigen in relation to blood transfusion and associated matters. And you can't hear properly. Technical support. It's got a green light on both. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in September of 1970, um, following that Department of Health meeting, the advisory group on testing for the presence of Australia hepatitis-associated antigen and its antibody, it's a rather lengthy uh, um, uh, name of a group, was formed under the chairmanship of Dr. Maycock. And we have its first report at PRSE 40190. Um, it, it's, again, quite a long document, and so I won't go through all of it. We can see if we go to the second page, please, Paul. Um, paragraph two, we have the terms of reference to advise the health department. Um, sorry, I should pick it up, in fact, before that, because we can see its geographical scope. We were appointed in September 1970 as an advisory group jointly by the Department of Health and Social Security, the Scottish Home and Health Department, and the Welsh Office, with the following terms of reference, to advise the health departments on the organisation of and responsibility for testing blood donations and other specimens of blood for Australia hepatitis-associated antigen and its antibody in the hospital service. Uh, two, the provision of reagents, choice of methods, and whether, and if so, what kind of training facilities are required. Three, the scale of accommodation, staffing, equipment, and other services necessary to implement the group's proposals. And we can see that their members included consultant virologists, directors of regional transfusion centres, and a senior technical officer of the Public Health Laboratory Service. They met first on the 5th of October 1970, met on five subsequent occasions, and then produced this uh, uh, particular report. Um, and if we go, please, to the page four, paragraph six, Paul, we can see it there said, knowledge of all aspects of Australia right page before that previous page that's it knowledge of all aspects of Australia hepatitis associated antigen is accumulating very rapidly our recommendations should therefore be regarded as interim ones and they may have to be modified in the light of new information uh, so this was uh, uh, as it says there part of the developing knowledge of, of what would soon be identified and labelled as hepatitis B. Uh, and if we then go to um, the next paragraph, please, next page, paragraph seven. We can see there, Australia Hepatitis Associated Antigen is the name used in WHO Memorandum 1970 for the antigen apparently associated with the infective uh, agents thought to be the cause of serum hepatitis, and then various other uh, names given for it are there set out. Um, uh, the association between the antigen and serum hepatitis, commonly accepted as the most frequent form of hepatitis observed following the injection of blood and blood products, is well established, and the antigen can now be detected by a variety of laboratory tests. And then if we go to the next paragraph, please. Paragraph 8. It says, although the hepatitis agent may be less widely dispersed in the UK than in some other countries, the institution of testing blood donations for Australia antigen should reduce the incidence of serum hepatitis, which is the most serious complication of transfusion and so avoid suffering and disablement and even death. So the aspiration from the early 70s was that the testing that was beginning to be available would enable there to be um, a reduction in the incidence of serum hepatitis. We'll, we'll see as we go through the 1970s how that panned out. But if we then just go, please, Paul, to, to be page 22, I think. It's headed chapter 10, summary of principal recommendations. Next page page. That's it. Thank you. Um, so summary of principal recommendations. For the reasons already given, we make the following recommendations. One, the regional transfusion centre should begin at the earliest possible date 
to test all blood donations for the presence of Australia hepatitis-associated antigen and its antibody. Uh, and then reference is made in the next paragraph to the form of testing and recommendations in relation to staffing, safety precautions, accommodation and equipment. And then if we go to four, little four, a donor found to be antigen or antibody positive should not be allowed to continue as a donor of blood intended for clinical use, and he should be told so and invited to give permission for his GP to be informed. Those were the recommendations at the beginning of the 1970s. Um, uh, we um, then will move on to RLIT 5076, please, Paul. This is April 1971. Thank you. Um, and it's a letter, again, from Jay Garrett Allen, the Professor of Surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine, um, to um, a, a medical publication, California Medicine, in April of 71, post-transfusion hepatitis. And he says this... Um, uh, first, the numbers of patients who develop post-transfusion hepatitis will be about 1 in 33 transfused when the blood from a volunteer population is contaminated with as much as 44% of blood from prison donors. The numbers of patients with transfusion hepatitis under these circumstances who will be able to show disability or who will die of this disease will be approximately 0.9% of the total transfused. If one considers only volunteer donors, we experience one case in, among every 278 patients and about one serious or fatal case among every 1,000 patients transfused. Second, the use of commercial blood carries a risk of causing transfusion hepatitis that is 10 to 70 times greater than when blood from volunteer donors is used. Third, it is not possible in most instances for the doctor to know if the blood his patient is about to receive is from a high or low risk population. And then if we go to the next column, please, Paul. Um, his sixth point, 90% of post-transfusion hepatitis from blood can be traced to the use of commercial or prison blood. The elimination of the use of these donors would be of most help to reduce transfusion hepatitis to a minimum until a test of greater accuracy can be developed to detect the infectious carrier. Uh, we cannot develop a reliable national all-volunteer blood program, you see this is in the States, as long as blood insurance programs are permitted to exist, or as long as commercial blood is part of a blood bank operation functioning under the euphemism of not-for-profit, this is an important matter to the patient's health. Um, it's still in 1971, could we go to DHSC three zeros, This is a report that was prepared for an April 1971 meeting of Haemophilia Centre Directors. And we'll be coming back, sir, to documentation relating to Haemophilia Centre Directors many times over the, the coming weeks as we hear witness uh, evidence from clinicians. For present purposes, I'll just look at the first page. We'll see it's entitled Jaundice and Factor Eight Antibodies in Treated Patients with Haemophilia and Christmas Disease. At a meeting of the directors of the 36 haemophilia centres of Great Britain held in 1967, it was decided to make a study of the incidence of transfusion hepatitis and inhibitors, two most alarming complications of treatment of patients with coagulation defects. Uh, and, and reference is made to, to forms having been prepared in, in which uh, clinicians were I invited to report uh, um, the incidence of jaundice. And then the next paragraph reads, transfusion hepatitis is thought to be a virus infection transmitted to the recipient by the donor plasma. There's every reason to suppose that the virus is contained in the various protein fractions used to treat haemophilia and Christmas disease, cryoprecipitate, human antihemophilic globulin or HAHG and factor IX concentrate. 
And then this, the danger of infection can be calculated and will be related to the number of donors used to make the material used for treatment or the number of donor exposures. If large pools of plasma are used to make therapeutic concentrates, the theoretical danger of infection will be increased. As I say, I'll, it's a document we'll come back to at, um, at a later stage of the hearing, so I'll, I'll leave that document there. Um, and moved to 1972, back to the States. Could we have, please, Paul, um, DHSC 013024 underscore 079. In March of 1972, in the States, President Nixon directed the Department of Health, Education and Welfare to study and recommend a safe, fast and efficient nationwide blood collection and distribution system. And it's there recorded that authorities in the health field regarded the present system as inadequate, pointing out that hospitals in many cases are forced to buy blood from commercial blood banks which often accept blood from such donors as derelicts and drug addicts who may be the transmitters of such diseases as hepatitis, syphilis, uh, and malaria. Uh, and there's another report, I don't ask you to put it up, Paul, but for the, um, uh, uh, in case anyone is interested in reading further on this, um, uh, Nixon's announcement is also described in RLIT 30223. Just before you, you leave yes. that document, this is not just an extract from an American publication which stays, as it were, in American readership, uh, because it seems the original uh, of this was sent to the CMO. Yes. And the CMO is now returning this for the files. Yes. So, so sometime, short, very shortly after President Nixon said what he said about the dangers of, of blood, um, the CMO here saw it. Yes, absolutely, sir. This is a Department of Health document, and, and, and you're right, we see from the bottom, original return to CMO, Chief Medical Officer, 29th of March, 1972. Um, could we then have, please, Paul, RLIT 40169. This is an... Uh, 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 an article by Dr. Maycock, whose name we've seen now a number of times from, at the Blood Products Laboratory in Elstree. It's headed Hepatitis in Transfusion Services. And there are just two passages we'll look at. The first is the, the first part of it. The transmission of viral hepatitis is the most serious complication of the use of blood and blood products. Two forms of hepatitis may be transmitted in this way. One has a short inf incubation period of some 15 to 40 days and is generally referred to as infectious hepatitis, a disease usually transferred by the orofecal route and assumed to be caused by an agent known as virus A or IH virus. The other form is serum hepatitis, one of the characteristics of which is a prolonged incubation period of some 40 to 150 days, occasionally 180 days. It is assumed to be caused by an agent known as virus B or SH virus. So we see here, and the, 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 the nomenclature, the terminology changes over the years, but we see here what we would commonly now refer to as hepatitis A and hepatitis B being identified here. Serum hepatitis seems to occur more frequently than infectious hepatitis as a result of the administration of blood and blood products. And then if we could go to the large, last page of this document, please, Paul. Under the heading conclusions, what Dr. Maycock there says is the incidence of serum hepatitis will diminish as transfusion services adopt the practice of excluding all donations of blood in which Australia antigen is, is detected. And then the next paragraph says this, following the demonstration of the association between the presence of Australia antigen in transfused blood and the occurrence of hepatitis in a proportion of the recipients, Terms such as safe blood and safe blood products were applied to blood and products derived from it in which the antigen had not been detected. At the present time, both terms are misleading because treatment with blood and blood products, except immunoglobulin and albumin, which has been heated, um, and it gives the details there, continues to carry the risk, admittedly a diminished one, of transmitting hepatitis. Blood and blood products known to be potentially icterogenic should be used with discrimination. 
They should be administered only when the benefits they are likely to confer upon the patient outweigh the risk to which their use exposes him. That's the view being expressed. The date is in, is 1972 um, uh, by Dr. Maycock of the Blood Products Laboratory. Um, oh, so I'm not going to go through all of the many reports in, in the first half of the 1970s that refer to this. Yes, of course. May I ask, Paul, is the, the live feed in, in the sense of the video feed with audio continuing? Well, what we'll do is this. We'll, we'll continue, since this isn't evidence, it's presentation, uh, and uh, Georgina can pick up uh, later um, and type in uh, in the transcript what, is, what has been missed, and she can do that uh, from a record of the live feed. So let's uh, continue Certainly on that so. basis. So um, from approximately 1972 onwards, we begin to see in various medical and scientific publications um, uh, observations from clinicians that even after the exclusion of donors who had tested positive um, uh, for hepatitis B antigen, there were still residual cases of post-transfusion hepatitis. And so it began to dawn upon clinicians that there may be another form of hepatitis transmitted by blood or blood products other than hepatitis B. There are a number of reports in, in relation to that. Um, and we'll just go um, for present purposes to, to one of them. Paul, it's PRSE 301431. This is a publication in The Lancet in August of 1974 by Prince and others. It's called Long Incubation Post-Transfusion Hepatitis Without Serological Evidence of Exposure to Hepatitis B Virus. Um, and we can um, uh, get the, the message from the summary. An agent other than hepatitis B virus seems to be the cause of 36, 71%, of 51 cases of post-transfusion hepatitis identified during prospective bi-weekly serological follow-up of 204 cardiovascular surgery patients. The sera of the 36 cases showed no evidence of the antigen or antibody response expected to accompany infection by HB virus and to be detectable by the sensitive assays used. 
uh, and then it refers to consideration of um, uh, cytomegalovirus, and then says this, the data suggests that a large proportion of long incubation post-transfusion hepatitis is unrelated to hepatitis B, and that control of post-transfusion hepatitis will require identification of a, hepatis, of a hepatitis virus is type C. And this is, I think, probably the first reference in the medical literature to what was subsequently identified as, as hepatitis C. Um, if we go to the last page of this document, please, Paul. Um, the, the first main paragraph on the left-hand side, the fact that non-B hepatitis cases are less frequently associated with serious acute illness does not imply that such cases are of lesser importance. Long-term complications of acute hepatitis B infection, such as chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis and hepatoma, have been reported to follow mild anicteric infections more frequently than severe icteric cases. Consideration must thus also be given to the possibility that non-B hepatitis may play a role in the etiology of some forms of chronic liver disease. So there again in this uh, uh, re report, identification of the potential serious long-term consequences for the liver um, of this newly um, uh, recognised uh, um, third form of hepatitis. Uh, and, and by the word uh, acute, we have to understand something lasting for six months or less. Yes. So the distinction so, is between, as it were, the short term and the longer term. Uh, so every disease will have its acute phase, but it, once it goes past six months, it becomes known as chronic. Yes. Um, uh, and if we have, please, Paul, CGRA 40694, I think we can see that, that this... Um, uh, finds its way uh, into um, national publication. This is the Times for November the 12th of 1974. Um, the science report, new strain of hepatitis uh, isolated. Um, and if we um, just pick it up in the um, second a third paragraph, two strains of virus have been known for a long time. Hepatitis A, originally called infectious or short incubation hepatitis, and hepatitis B, sometimes called post-transfusion hepatitis, because it's spread through donated serum and other blood products and injections with contaminated needles. The existence of at least one other strain has been apparent during the past six or seven years because research has shown that a large number of patients, particularly those infected from transfusion or injection, were not carrying the hepatitis A or B strains. In the United States, up to 50% of transfusion-associated illness is caused by this third non-A, non-B agent. So we see there the terminology that over the following years became associated with this particular virus, non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, could we then, Paul, move to CBLA 40249, please? This is an important letter from... Uh, Dr. Garrett Allen again, to Dr. Maycock this time, of the Blood Products Laboratory. It's dated the 6th of January 1975. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, Professor Garrett Allen is raising questions about the usage of factors 8 and factors 9. Uh, and we pick it up in the third paragraph. Dr. Poole, that's a reference to Dr. Judith Poole, spent the past year at Oxford and tells me that at least one of the sources for commercial factor eight and nine is the Highland Laboratories in the Los Angeles area. Dr. Briggs mentioned in her letter in Lancet last June 29th that there were two other commercial sources, but Judy Poole did not know which they were or whether they were from the United States. As you know, Cutter's product CO9 for factor nine deficiency has proved extraordinarily hazardous, a 50 to 90% rate of icteric hepatitis developing from it. About half of these cases prove fatal. Cutter's source of blood is 100% from Skid Row derelicts. The other imponderable which has troubled most of us is the ineffectiveness in screening for the HB antigen. This failure, of course, dates back to at least 1971, 
and suggests that half, if not more, of the cases of post-transfusion hepatitis are caused by an agent other than hepatitis A or B. Whatever this other agent may be, it still seems to be more frequently encountered in the lower socioeconomic groups of paid and prison donors. Uh, and then if we go to the next paragraph, a blood bank for these groups in the United States is a monotropic establishment. The commercial blood banks attract these kinds of donors. Until we understand this problem better, I would hope that Great Britain would give some thought to what the purchase of factors eight and nine from the United States tends to do to our attempts to form a volunteer program. Commercial blood banking perpetuates the high risk rates for hepatitis we encounter with their products. And it also tempts those same commercial firms to sell the residual products of these high risk donors to non-immunized patients who tend to be more susceptible to post-transfusion hepatitis than is so, than, than is so far the non-virgin haemophiliacs. Uh, when he uses the word uh, monitotrophic, uh, he's saying it attracts money, is he? Uh, yes, I assume so, sir. It's an unusual word, it but is. I think that's what it means. It is. It's not one I've ever come across, and I'm afraid it's not one I looked up. So I'm going to defer to your greater knowledge. Well, well that. tropic, I think, means attracting, and monito sounds like money to me. Uh, if anyone has a better definition, then they can let me know in due course. Oh, I'm sure someone sitting alongside or behind me will, will be online on the Oxford English Dictionary as we speak. That's a hint. Um, um, for, again, for reference, I'm, I'm not going to take to it, but we, we do have Dr. Maycock's reply, and for those who are interested, it's at CBLA 40254. C can I then, um, 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 and we're still in 1975 here, go to PRSE 509. This is a document that Lord Owen referred to in his evidence yesterday, but which we didn't look at during his evidence. I might have missed out a zero then, Paul, sorry. Thank you. Um, so this is, it's an example of what Lord Owen referred to as a dear doctor letter. So a means by which the chief medical officer might communicate advice and information to medical practitioners. This is dated the 1st of May 1975 to all regional medical officers. Um, it's headed blood donation and hepatitis. Uh, and um, it is from uh, uh, Dr. Yellowlees, who was the then chief medical officer says the department's recently received advice from a group of experts on the use of blood donations from certain categories of donors. Various matters are then set out relating to geographical factors. I'm not going to ask, uh, spend time on that for present purposes, but if we could go to the second page. Under the heading prisons, the letter says this. There is a relatively high risk of hepatitis B being transmitted by the blood of prisoners. But there is probably an equally high risk in other groups of the population, e.g. drug addicts, who are not so easily identified in advance as prisoners, if they can be identified at all. The advice we have received is that it is not necessary to discontinue the collection of blood at prisons and similar institutions, provided all donations are subjected to one of the more sensitive tests referred to above. Um, and we'll come back when we look at a document in the 80s to the question of the continuing collection of blood from prison, prisons in the United Kingdom. Um, without, again, going to um, uh, too many documents, there are further articles reported in the course of the mid-1970s about this newly um, understood and recognised hepatic virus. Um, one example again, for the benefit of those who, who want to look at this in more detail, is a report by Ulta in The Lancet in November 1975. Paul, you don't need to put it up on screen, but it's PRSE 301172. Um, that brings us to the end of 1975. And what I propose to do now, sir, is to play um, the World in Action documentary that was broadcast in two parts on the 1st of December 1975, and then a week later on the 8th of December 1975. Many of you will have seen this and be very familiar with it, but not everyone, and the broader public may not know that in 1975 this documentary was made and broadcast. And it's going to provide an important backdrop for the evidence we hear from clinicians and others over the coming months. So, um, Paul, could we play, please, MDIA 40113? 
This is part one of Blood Money, the World in Action documentary broadcast on the 1st of December 1975. Chester, County Durham. Andrew Atkinson is nine and suffers from a rare incurable blood disease called haemophilia. His blood won't clot naturally. It lacks the vital clotting agent known as Factor 8. Andrew is a severe haemophiliac. He frequently bleeds internally into muscles and joints, particularly his ankles. The only way he can stop painful bleeds and prevent permanent crippling is to immediately inject himself with Factor 8. For Andrew and an increasing number of Britain's 3,000 haemophiliacs, this means a special concentrated form of American Factor 8 called haemophil. Can you move your hand? I'll be able to do it now. Haemophil is made from thousands of donations of human blood plasma, the straw coloured liquid that carries red and white cells through the veins. That's another hit, ma'am. It's the wrong one. Haemophil and other Factor VIII concentrates have revolutionised the lives of many haemophiliacs. Before haemophil, Neil Robinson used a British Factor VIII product called cryoprecipitate, but he had to be treated in hospital. In one year alone, he made 98 visits to hospital and was off school for three months. Haemophil's easier to handle and treats a bleed immediately. That's it. Well, we are starting to lead our lives, which uh, I think, and this is what life is all about, we're starting to live before... It was living between hospital and home. I wouldn't call that living. But uh, we are living as a family now, and I think this is very important. What sort of things are you doing now that you have never done before? Going on holiday. Well, going on holiday to start with. This is one important factor. We did try holidays in the past, and I'm afraid they weren't very successful. For Andrew Atkinson and his family, it has also meant a more normal life. To us, it's made a terrific difference, pure and simply, because if we want to go anywhere, we can take it with us. It's much easier to give. We give it ourselves. He gives it himself as well now. To watch him do it himself, I think it's a great thing when you're just nine-year-old. I think he's doing something that I couldn't do at nine-year-old. I think it takes a lot of courage. But products like Haemophil, as its makers admit, also carry a high risk of transmitting hepatitis, a painful, debilitating liver disease. Some haemophiliacs are immune to this risk because they have had hepatitis due to their many transfusions, but many are not. Even more disturbing, new evidence from three American studies links concentrates with subsequent liver damage. Professor Ari Zuckerman of London University is a world authority on hepatitis. Well, hepatitis uh, or jaundice is a particularly interesting infection because the severity of the illness ranges from a very mild uh, form of infection, perhaps with trivial symptoms, to a, uh, an attack of jaundice with quite a lot of disability, which may last for some weeks or perhaps even months. And it is associated with a significant uh, death rate. In addition, uh, in a number of cases, it may progress to chronic liver damage and may end up in a condition such as uh, chronic active hepatitis or cirrhosis of the liver. So that it really is uh, potentially quite a serious disease. Haemophil was first imported two years ago because the blood transfusion service couldn't meet demands for more concentrates. Okay. Now, for the first time, British haemophiliacs have discovered this high risk. Since April 1974, there's been an unprecedented outbreak of hepatitis among haemophiliacs. Nearly 60 cases have been traced so far, including two which may have contributed to the deaths of those haemophiliacs. The man who discovered the hepatitis outbreak is Dr John Crask, consultant virologist at a Manchester hospital. Checking amongst uh, the instance of hepatitis in the local population showed that there was no abnormal instance of hepatitis in the local community or amongst the relatives of the patients affected. And it seemed, therefore, that the most likely thing was uh, the introduction of some new product or um, uh, something else associated with their treatment. We therefore checked the uh, 
transfusion histories of these patients, and it became apparent that this jaundice was associated with the administration of one particular batch of a commercial concentrate of uh, anti-hemophilic factor called hemophil, which had been introduced for use for the first time at the end of 1973. So far, the evidence would suggest that 58 cases of hepatitis in all have been found. Keith Proud is one of the worst cases reported to Dr. Krask. For the last two years, he's been treating himself at home in Gateshead with haemophil. A year ago, he caught hepatitis. It started off with uh, backache, things like that, feeling pretty rotten. Uh, a couple of days after that, I started to turn yellow. The whites of my eyes went yellow. I uh, started vomiting. And generally feeling pretty rough. I couldn't eat anything. I was only drinking fluids. Keith Proud's case, like all the others and the two deaths, has been linked with the use of this product, Hemophil. So World in Action decided to go to America where it's made to discover why the hepatitis outbreak has occurred and just how great a risk to health Hemophil is. The valley is now 75 degrees at Orange County in downtown Los Angeles, 70, currently in Hollywood 66. Unlike Britain, where blood is given voluntarily, in America, plasma is bought. Much of it is bought from men who need money badly, like those down here on the skid rows of America's big cities. But paid donors carry six to 13 times the risk of having hepatitis as volunteer donors, and they can pass it on. To discover why, a World in Action investigator spent four weeks visiting plasma centers, selling plasma, talking to donors, and examining safeguards. Tonight, World in Action investigates the health risk to Britain's haemophiliacs from the men who sell their blood in America. Blood and plasma products like Factor 8 are big business in America. This is Costa Mesa, California, south of Los Angeles. Here is the headquarters of the Highland Division of Travanol, a subsidiary of Baxter Laboratories, a leading US drug company and the makers of Hemophil. The company buys plasma in 13 American states and Puerto Rico. We asked them if we could film inside one of their plasma centers. They refused. One reason, unattractive outside situations and unattractive donors. We therefore decided to investigate for ourselves, starting here in Baltimore on America's east coast. This is East Baltimore Street, the city's skid row. This area with its bars, sex shops and peep shows is home to many Baltimore alcoholics and down and outs. Here we found the Highland Donor Center. It is 6 a.m. and the temperature is near freezing. The plasma center does not open until 7.30, but the queue of donors starts to form well before then. Many of these men are out of work. Plasma centers are booming because of the current recession. Unemployment is highest among the black population who make up a large proportion of plasma donors. Government rules say any donor under the influence of alcohol is unsuitable, and centers tell donors not to drink 24 hours before selling plasma. But many we saw did just that. Donors are allowed to sell half a liter of plasma twice a week. They usually get two pounds 50 for the first half liter and five pounds for the second. When the donors left, none of them would agree to be filmed. We decided to continue our investigations in another part of America. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the Deep South. Across the road from the Salvation Army in a rundown part of town, we found another Highland Plasma Center. Once again, the queue, many of them unemployed, had formed well before the center opened at 8 a.m. The nurse in charge refused to let us film inside. However, we were able to get some scenes of what happens in a plasma center. Plasma is collected by an hour-long process called plasmapheresis. A liter of blood is taken from the donor. This is then spun in a centrifuge and the red cells separated out and returned to the donor. Highland is left with about half a liter of plasma. From 2,000 to 6,000 liters are then pooled and concentrated factor eight extracted. Hepatitis thrives in unhygienic living conditions such as those often found in warmer southern states like Louisiana. As well as by injection, it's passed on by close personal contact and contaminated food. To assess the health risk from US paid donors to haemophiliacs in Britain, World in Action invited Professor Ari Zuckerman, a leading British hepatitis expert, to join us. We took him to California, where Highland has six plasma centers. 
California has more cases of hepatitis than any other state. Well, it's been recognized for a number of years now that raw blood does carry a higher risk. And it's difficult to actually pinpoint the reason, but it seems that uh, individuals who are willing to sell their blood are normally uh, from a background which appears to be rather poor socioeconomically. In the past, uh, many of them were uh, alcoholics, and indeed uh, a well-known dictum uh, which originated in the United States was booze for booze. This has recently been replaced by perhaps a more serious element, namely drug addicts. 5 a.m. the next morning, Professor Zuckerman visits the Highland Center at San Jose, 50 miles south of San Francisco. Once again, we find ourselves among men at the bottom of American society. But for the first time, we find a donor who is prepared to talk to us. His name is Gary. Why did you come down? I need the money. Do you have a job? No. Why not? Because I can't get employment. I'm on parole. Yeah, 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 yeah. How much do I get paid? Eight dollars. It's my eight dollar day. Pardon me? Do the questions that they ask you in there before you give plasma, do you always answer them truthfully? Are you going to tell them? No. <laughs> no. no, you know. You, you, some, you know. Yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> yeah. But what, what sort of questions wouldn't you answer truthfully? Well, they ask you stuff like, you know, if you've been drinking and stuff like that, you know the night before, you know, if you've been eating right and all that crap, you know, I'm a big fat dude, so it don't matter if I've been eating right or not, I'm healthy, you know. Morning, darling. Shove it. Shove it. Grab it. Questioning about a donor's medical history is important in keeping out unsuitable donors. But from talking to donors, World in Action found that it is not unusual for them to lie about their health. <coughs> Pardon me while I puke. <coughs> By offering to sell plasma in five Highland centers, we established even more disturbing facts. One, no check was made on the false addresses we gave. This can admit down and outs, a high hepatitis risk. Two, Highland doctors did not always carry out the only checks that can detect drug users. Drug users are among the highest risk for hepatitis. Three, physical examinations were not always done fully, though certified as such. Four, certain medical questions were not asked, but were filled in as having been answered satisfactorily. The Bureau of Biologics, which controls plasma centers, has also criticized Highland. Since November last year, the company has been warned 13 times for breaking federal regulations at its plasma centers and processing plants. Last year, the Bureau temporarily closed one center. We were asked to stop filming inside the San Jose Center, but we left Professor Zuckerman inside to observe the donors and what happened to them. While we waited for him, we asked another regular plasma donor, an out-of-work laborer, whether down and outs sold plasma. Well, mostly it was sometimes, yes. It's like uh, you're going to straight down and you're broke. You've got no place to stay. That's the first place uh, you go to. Uh, blood bank. Because uh, otherwise, uh, the guy doesn't know what to do. He's going to look for a blood bank. Do you know alcoholics who give their blood? Mostly are alcoholics. Do you know drug addicts who give their blood? No, I don't think they'll accept them. But they accept alcoholics? Certainly. See, the alcohol, like uh, wine or whiskey, whatever it is, it brings your blood up, puts iron in your blood. Later, we asked Professor Zuckerman what he thought of the donors he'd seen. One of the strongest impressions that I obtained is the type of donor uh, that was presenting himself at this center. I was somewhat surprised to see uh, that a number of individuals were clearly uh, malnourished and obviously these are uh, individuals uh, who should not donate blood and particularly should not have protein removed from their circulation. Another type of person that uh, was presenting himself at the center was the vagabond type, individuals who have just come off buses, uh, people who were uh, ill-camped, um, one or two persons who one would probably regard as uh, drug users. How many of the people that you saw presenting themselves here today would be accepted by the blood transfusion service in England? 
Well, this is my own uh, judgment as a physician, would be that most of them would have been rejected uh, straight away. Professor Zuckerman then took us to meet America's leading campaigner against the paid donor system, Dr. J. Garrett Allen, professor of surgery at Stanford University. Won't you come on in? Thank you. The two men discussed Dr. Allen's work on the hepatitis risk from paid donors and the recently discovered extra risk of liver damage from using concentrates. Afterwards, we talked to Dr. Allen. What sort of evidence is there that shows the degree of risk that you run if you use blood taken from paid donors? There are a number of studies that have been made in the past decade or less in which the risk runs from six to 70 times greater than were the donors all from a volunteer source, friends and relatives and such. What is the reason for that? The reason for that is that the paid donor is offered so little money that no uh, one is willing to take time off his work to go give uh, transfusions and therefore most of these uh, donors are unemployed, are transients, uh, and uh, live in a lifestyle that none of us would put up with. How effective are the tests in preventing hepatitis virus getting into these pools? We really don't know how many viruses are involved. There are at least two and perhaps more. Uh, the major one, hepatitis B virus, uh, is detected fairly well, but it appears that at least two-thirds more uh, infectious bloods or donors uh, will escape detection by the use of this test because the test does not apply to their virus. We then moved to Los Angeles where Professor Zuckerman took us to meet two other leading experts on the risks attached to factor 8 concentrates. Dr. Alan Redeker and Dr. James Mosley, professors of medicine at the University of Southern California. We asked Dr. Mosley about the risks of pooling thousands of donations in order to make hemophil. Well, even if you have a very low carrier rate in a population, if it's one in a hundred and you pool a hundred units, that one is going to contaminate the other 99. If it's one in a thousand and you pool them, it's going to contaminate the other 999. And uh, particularly if there is a concentration technique which not only concentrates the factor that you're interested in, the clotting factor, but also concentrates the virus. And unfortunately, uh, uh, that happens to be true for the uh, clotting factors. Uh, the virus is concentrated along uh, with them. So even with the best donors, a large pool is a risk, and the larger the pool, the higher the risk. What are the chances of someone catching hepatitis from using a product made from the plasma of these type of people? If it's a blood product that cannot be sterilized, and that's true for the clotting factor concentrates, uh, the risk is uh, probably 100% if the individual is susceptible. Dr. Mosley told us many British haemophiliacs could be susceptible, especially those needing few injections. They've had no experience of hepatitis or of products made from large pools of bought plasma. The Highland Donor Center in downtown Los Angeles is in the heart of the Skid Row area. The drinking of alcohol is common around plasma centers. We were told many donors drink to build up the iron in their blood to pass a test before they sell. Others believe it speeds up their circulation, enabling them to give blood faster. But for many men on Skid Row, drinking is an all-day, everyday affair. Here, there is no shortage of alcoholics who, because of their lifestyle, are likely to be hepatitis carriers. To continue our investigation into the cause of the hepatitis outbreak in Britain, Professor Zuckerman visited his second Highland donor center. While he remained inside, we toured the neighborhood, which has no less than five plasma centers and blood banks. Hepatitis is a common disease in the overcrowded, poor areas of big cities like Los Angeles, but it is also a major problem throughout America. At this plasma center, near Highlands, which is owned by a major independent plasma supplier, we found one man who talked frankly about paid donors and who they are. The manager, Russell S. Tate. What about alcoholics? Do you think that you have many people who are alcoholics that come in here? 
Uh, yes, we probably get a proportionate number. We screen them very carefully, though, and try not to let them donate. But you still think that you have quite a few that probably get through your screening process? Yes, I'm sure we do. What about drug addicts? There again, that's uh, a possibility that runs fairly high. Uh, we try to screen them the best way we can, but uh, it's very difficult to do that. When, in fact, you examine the donors, how much do you rely on them answering truthfully the questions that the nurses ask them? Mm, probably about 50% of our questioning is based on their, an on their answers. And do you think it's safe to rely on a man answering a question truthfully when if he answers the question the wrong way, he won't receive any money, which is really why he's here? Um, it may not be fair, but it's about the only way we can do it. Do you think it's ethical for a company to take blood or plasma from people who are on the lowest level of society and then sell it at quite a profitable transaction? <laughs> it's American business. I don't know whether it's ethical or not, no, I, but it, uh, uh, up to this point in time, no one has found an acceptable substitute for human blood, so we have to get it somehow. Back at the Highland Center, the donors had started to come out. One of the first was Bill, an unemployed dishwasher. He said today was the 176th time he'd sold plasma. You come down here if you've got a job? No. So you only come down here if And I'm not working. Yeah? Have you, been wor have you been working for the last three months? No, I've worked a couple days last week, but not really, you know, not enough to keep going. Where do you live? Usually hotels, if I haven't got enough, any not work, and I stay in one of the missions here in L.A. How much does that cost you? Hotels run about two and a quarter. The missions are free. What in that case, other than if you get $15 a week, is that for you to keep, enough to keep alive? No. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, I hope I could get work, or else, or if I don't get the work, I'll eat at different missions throughout the rest of the week. What do you eat at the missions? Beans, mostly. Nothing, nothing but beans. Mostly beans, other things. They have sometimes spaghetti, sometimes, you know, various different missions. Like many Skid Row donors, Bill, who is 33, spends most of his day hanging around the area. Most mornings and afternoons, he comes here, the St. Vincent Center, known as the Misery House. This is where Skid Row down and outs spend their time until the missions open in the evening. Highland, like certain other companies in America making Factor 8 concentrates, relies on hundreds of bills for plasma. But for several years, the company has also bought plasma even cheaper in developing countries. There, the hepatitis risk is often greater. Buying plasma is an international business. Reportedly, Highland has bought plasma in Central America and the Caribbean, South America and Africa. The World Health Organization and the Red Cross are trying to stop the plasma traffic, but Highland still buys plasma for haemophil outside mainland America. Baxter Laboratories, which owns Highland, has become one of America's fastest-growing drug companies. Thanks in part to haemophil and other plasma products, since 1970, Baxter's net profits have grown from £7.17 million to £18.14 million last year. After visiting 10 of Baxter's 24 Highland Plasma Centers, we ended our investigation here in Deerfield, Illinois, near Chicago, at the Baxter headquarters. We put the questions it had raised to Baxter's Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs, Dr. Richard S. Wilbur. What is your reaction to the cases of hepatitis that have occurred in England amongst haemophiliacs who have been using haemophil? Reported cases uh, of hepatitis, uh, particularly by Dr. Kraske, which uh, appeared in Lancet last year, occurred from earlier batches which were made before we were able to use the newer techniques of screening for hepatitis B, which we now have. We were very pleased to read that the cases were all mild. I believe that uh, the most severe per, uh, case, uh, the person was sick for something like six weeks. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to have hepatitis, but when one compares the benefit to the patient, of taking uh, the factor eight concentrate as compared with this relatively mild disease, uh, we feel that the risk-benefit ratio for that patient was a good one. But let me emphasize, we have improved our techniques for screening our donors for hepatitis since that date. It is much less likely that future batches will cause hepatitis. We have every intention of going ahead and getting still better techniques for screening for hepatitis. 
What's your view of the, as a doctor, of the quality of the people that sell plasma to Highland? As a doctor, I don't make any judgments on the quality of people. I accept them all as they are. Well, what is your view then, not as a doctor, as of the of the donors? As, as a human being, I'd prefer not to make uh, that sort of value judgment on the quality of my fellow humans. I, I find them for what they are. Have you visited the Highland Donor Centers? Only one. Only one? Yes. What did you think of the people that you saw there? They were human beings, such as I took care of when I practiced medicine. Can you explain to me how it is, if you're so careful in checking the people that donate plasma or sell plasma, how it is possible that I can go to a Highland Donor Center and I can have a physical examination filled out in which questions are put into, to which I've been an I have supposedly answered yes, that were never put to me, and examinations are indicated to have been carried out that never were carried out? No, I can't. But in fact, can you explain to me why, in fact, if, for example, people are asked whether they're alcoholics, that I have been in Highland Donor Centers where people have been there and have donated plasma, who smelled a drink, who drank before they came in and went straight out of the donor center and bought a bottle of wine afterwards. If you say so, I have no reason to uh, disagree with you. But, I mean, would you dispute that that would happen? No, I wouldn't dispute uh, if you say it has. But doesn't that... What you've observed, uh, that isn't uh, the protocol we've set up, no. Doesn't that strike you as disturbing, that we could actually see this? Yes, we would prefer that uh, all of the plasma were available from better sources. And we do not deliberately seek out uh, as a source of plasma the unfortunate people in the country. As I said before, we would vastly prefer to have it uh, from voluntary donors, just as everyone would like to have uh, blood transfusions from voluntary donors. How safe do you think paid donors are? If we could get this factor only from voluntary donors, as you say, from the upper levels of society, we would do that. Until we can, we must get what we may. Just getting it so we don't get on the ground. Mm -hmm. World in Action's investigation has confirmed that haemophil carries a high risk for three reasons. The use of paid donors, its production from large plasma pools, and the inadequacy of hepatitis tests. Next week, we investigate why Britain is importing haemophil, its cost to the National Health Service, and why British pioneer work did not ensure enough of a safer British-made concentrate. So we've eaten to lunch by probably seven or eight minutes. If we play the second half now, start yes. lunch a little late, have the full lunch and then pick up the documents again after lunch, if that's all right. That would be a good idea. So if we could play the second part of this documentary, Paul, which is MDIA 40114. decided to go to America where it's made to discover why the hepatitis outbreak has occurred and just how great a risk to health haemophil is. Last week, World in Action investigated the American blood business. On the skid rows of several cities, we talked to men who sell their blood plasma for money. Our investigation took us to 10 of the 24 plasma centers of the Highland Division of Baxter Laboratories, a leading American drug company. We found that Highland's paid donors included many alcoholics and down and outs. Paid donors are from six to 13 times more of a health hazard than British volunteer blood donors. Because of their lifestyle, many carry a high risk of passing on hepatitis, a serious liver disease. Blood plasma for men like these is being used in Britain in this Highland product, Haemophil, a concentrated form of factor VIII. Factor VIII is the clotting agent in the blood. Neil Robinson suffers from haemophilia, a rare, incurable blood disorder. His blood won't clot naturally because it lacks factor VIII. To stop internal bleeding and crippling, haemophiliacs can be treated with a British factor VIII product called cryoprecipitate, but this may mean a hospital visit. More conveniently, they can treat themselves at home with a special concentrated factor VIII product like the American haemophil. Many prefer this, it's easier and treats bleeding without delay. 
Britain does produce some Factor 8 concentrate, but most is imported and comes from paid donors. In the last 18 months, imported haemophil has been linked with an unprecedented outbreak of hepatitis among Britain's 3,000 haemophiliacs. Tonight, World in Action investigates why Britain has had to import high-risk concentrates and how much it has cost. First, we went back to Newcastle to the families in last week's film. All three attend a haemophilia centre at this hospital where the doctor in charge treats many of his patients with haemophil. One, Keith Proud, caught hepatitis while using haemophil. Had he been put off? The only time that I felt that I was wondering about whether it was worth it was when I was vomiting really badly. But two days later, I had a bleeding in my elbow and I had no hesitation in going to the fridge, getting the haemophil out, mixing it and injecting it because I knew that would stop the bleed. And the pain from that bleed was going to be so much worse than any of the pain I'd suffered with hepatitis. As much as I feel that uh, Keith was really ill when he had hepatitis, he suffered far more when, he was, when there was nothing at all. And they are progressing. Would you prefer a National Health Service concentrate made from voluntary blood donors in Britain? Obviously, this, this would be better. Uh, Obviously, if it's donated uh, freely, there is less chance of people passing on hepatitis. People that are donating it are at uh, less risk value. But until that is available, we uh, have to accept the risks. The second family we visited last week was the Atkinsons. Their son, Andrew, uses haemophil. What do you feel about the type of donors who are selling their plasma for haemophil? This is something we knew. Well, not exactly knew. We, we had, it had been explained to us before. And uh, there are people who are prepared to give the blood. And we are people looking for them those people. We want the, the, uh, the factor aid from them. Would you prefer a National Health Service concentrate made from safer voluntary donors in Britain? Who wouldn't? This is, we, we think, yes, it would be much better. But uh, at the moment, well, do you think they would be able to get enough blood from voluntary sources? We doubt this very much at the moment. We would like to see it very much. Next, we visited the Robinson family. Neil has been on home treatment with haemophil for the last two years. We know the risks that we have to take with our children. We don't gamble with their lives, but we do take a calculated risk. Haemophil is one of the calculated risks. We know what it's done for us. And only people who live with haemophilia know what it's like. But what is your reaction to the type of people who are selling plasma to make haemophil? We shouldn't be allowed to. It is very bad. It's, it's well, we don't want it. But what other alternative have we got? For two years, Neil has lived a normal life through haemophil. We don't like the, the idea of these donor notes, skid road types, what have you, given this blood. No, but Britain could cut the risks down. Britain could cut the risk down. We're making their own, but... Well, they are, to a certain extent, making their own. They, they, they own. could make their own, they could make all of it. And then the risks would be considerably less. How strongly do you feel that the National Health Service should produce a British safer product? Well, after your last programme, very, very strongly. We would like to see this happen. We prefer British. We know that British is pure, or purer than... The American. There's less chance of uh, contacting hepatitis through a British product. We only hope that the British government and the National Health Service have sit up and take notice of this and do something about it. Well, in the state of the country now, they can produce it a lot cheaper than what they can buy it from America. And why British pioneer work did not ensure enough of a safer British made concentrate. World in Action asked the Executive Committee of the Haemophilia Society, a pressure group for haemophiliacs, to watch our report. 
The society has been campaigning for more commercial concentrates. After the program, they discussed their reactions. If we accept, and I think most of us do, that we would prefer to see all the material coming from production in this country through the blood transfusion and the, net and the health service, I just, if the Department of Health or whoever's responsible don't do something constructive about improving supplies in this country, the logical step is going to be commercial production in this country eventually. Yeah. And if the, the dangers in the States are repeated here, we could be in trouble. Yeah, but we understand, don't we, that uh, there's not a shortage of donors as such, it's just a shortage of the uh, facilities to make the uh, concentrate. But do we? We're always well, being told yeah. something different. We're being told there's a shortage of donors, there's a shortage of equipment, there's a shortage of money. What is the shortage? We never seem to get any nearer to the answer. We've been, for the last 10 years, we're being told there's a shortage and everything will be all right in five years' time. But nothing ever changes, probably because of the increased demand. But what is the sh shortage? Nobody ever really puts their finger on it. I think most of us would prefer deep down to be using National Health Service mm -hmm. and blood transfusion products. But I feel very uneasy about commercial concentrates. And after seeing this programme, I should think a lot of other people would be even more uneasy. I must admit, one of the, the things that disturbed me, rather, was to see the pictures of Skid Row, which seems a bit at variance with the assurances that the commercial companies have given us. Um, you know, they're not using this sort of blood for factor eight. Uh, I'm wondering whether, in fact, the, uh, the other companies are using the same sort of blood. Uh, I, I had a talk at, uh, in August with one of the certain others, as they put it in the programme, um, who said, we're not using that sort of blood at all for our factor eight production. Well, is that just Highland? Is that, in fact, representative of all the other commercial companies? Or is that just part of Highland's production and is, in fact, hemophil made from other blood? It, it's something we'll still have to look at. Because, as I say, it doesn't really seem to gel with what we've been told. So, yeah. One of the things I noticed on that programme was the, 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 the sort of ethical problems and social problems which, uh, which it posed, and that is the question of whether people, the less fortunate people should be used or uh, used as donors, whether we should take blood from them, whether commercial firms should take blood from them. Well, I'm quite sure that the answer for the haemophiliac in this country would be he's not really too bothered about where the blood comes from as long as he's got that blood concentrate to keep him going, and in some cases to keep him alive. No doubt whatsoever in my mind, of course, Equally well, he'd much sooner, if there were a sufficient number of uh, well-disposed people, and there are thousands upon thousands of them already in this country, who would come along and regularly give blood, and who weren't undernourished, who weren't alcoholics, who weren't drug, drug addicts, I'm sure that they would be delighted. If there were sufficient uh, blood donors come along, as you say, would the National Health Service have the facilities to be able to produce the concentrate from it? Yeah. And it we don't know that they have the facilities. And in fact, we, you know, when we do inquire about this, they say, yes, they have. Well, if so, why aren't we getting the concentrate from this country? If there's sufficient donors, why aren't we getting the concentrate? To answer the questions raised by the Haemophilia Society and our three families, World in Action came here to the Blood Products Laboratory at Elstree, north of London. England's small amount of home-produced factor eight concentrate is made here and at a smaller plant in Oxford from the plasma of volunteer blood donors. The day-long process takes place three times a week. It was decided to build this plant in the mid-1960s, but the completion was delayed by administrative changes, building hold-ups, and disagreements among doctors about whether concentrates were the best way to treat hemophiliacs. The plant was finally ready in the early 1970s, but by then, because of the popularity of home treatment, the amount it needed to produce had shot up to ten times the original estimate. To fill the gap, England imported commercial concentrates. The man in charge of producing factor eight concentrate in England is Dr William Maycock, the senior advisor to the Department of Health on blood transfusion policy. After the expert committee gave its advice in 1973, there was, so to speak, a sudden demand. Um, well, quite clearly, this couldn't be met overnight. Um, a lot of reorganization had to be carried out, um, which involved uh, accommodation, equipment, and staff, 
it's clearly going to take considerable time. One could have uh, left it and said, well, we'll get round to this when we've made our arrangements, or one could say we will meet the need now by importing, um, having decided to become self-sufficient. Uh, this, in fact, is, is what happened. Was it, in your view, ever possible that we could have produced fat rate concentrates much earlier in Britain, given the work that was done on some of the processes associated with it? Well, it's always easy to, to, look, to look back and see what might have been done. Uh, I think had um, certain decisions and certain things been made and certain things not happened, we obviously could have done this. But was the decision to import concentrates in 1973 an acceptable risk? By then, the high hepatitis risk of paid donors was well known. Our investigations show that subsequently, the Department of Health was advised against importing concentrates. The warning came last January from America's leading campaigner against paid donors, Dr. J. Garrett Allen. He wrote to Dr. Maycock. By this time, the Department of Health had been alerted to the hepatitis cases linked with haemophil. Dr. Allen sent this warning. Commercial blood banking perpetuates the high-risk rates for hepatitis we encounter with their products, and it also tempts these same commercial firms to sell residual products. On February 13th, Dr. Allen wrote again, repeating his concern. It does not take much commercial blood in a mixed combination to bring up an astounding attack rate from one that is relatively unnoticed. This is the basis of my concern about Britain purchasing commercial blood products from our country. Do you think that, in fact, we were wise in not perhaps taking greater notice of the views of people like Dr. Allen about these risks? Dr. Garrett Allen's views are, or his uh, observations have all been published and were well known to um, those concerned who, um, who are using this material. Do you not think in that case that perhaps we might have been somewhat complacent about these risks in the light of what has happened? No, I don't think so. Um, um, I think the quality of this material was controlled. Um, both here and in, um, in America. Dr. Maycock's view is not shared here at London University by the World Health Organization's hepatitis expert, Professor Ari Zuckerman. Professor Zuckerman tests English-made factor eight concentrate for the hepatitis virus. It is well recognized that the commercial donor carries a considerably greater risk of transmitting hepatitis than the volunteer donor. And indeed, there are two uh, WHO recommendations now that efforts must be made to stop uh, the commercial uh, practice of uh, collection of blood. And indeed, if you consider all the uh, technology that we now have at our disposal for detecting hepatitis B virus, the single most effective measure in reducing the incidence of hepatitis following transfusion has been in the United States the exclusion of the commercial donor. British-made concentrates aren't entirely free of risk either because they're made by pooling from 100 to 200 litres of plasma. No test can detect every hepatitis virus and any one virus can contaminate the whole pool. Since last year, Professor Zuckerman has detected a surprising number of infected batches of English concentrate. But more sensitive testing is on the way, and Britain's volunteer donors are considerably less of a risk than paid donors. Today, the National Health Service is producing three times the amount of concentrate it was making in 1973. The aim is to be self-sufficient by 1977. But is the production capacity there to do this, and is there a shortage of donors? No, uh, in the sense that once the organization has been made to prepare the plasma, uh, sufficient will be available. But as I said a little earlier, uh, this is a concerted plan which is now being fulfilled and we hope to reach our target in mid-1977. In other words, there is no lack of capacity or lack of, of donors to give plasma for making these products? Oh no, I don't think so at all. There's certainly no lack of donors. Factor 8 concentrate is also made here in Edinburgh at this new £2 million plant. Scotland has never needed to import concentrates. 
This plant is designed to produce factor 8 concentrate for England as well as Scotland, but so far no plasma has been sent here for processing from England. The scientific director of the Scottish Blood Transfusion Association, John Watt. Uh, we should be able at the capacity to more than produce the need of all plasma fractions for Scotland, um, certainly by the spring of next year. Uh, after, the, after that, it will depend on the policy arrangements which have to be made between the Scottish Health Service and the National Health Service, the Department of Health and Social Security. But if plasma was made available from England and Wales now, could you actually produce more of that trade concentrate than you're doing? Yes. Would that inf how much more would you be able to produce? We could, we could go to a capacity of a thousand litres per week. And would that in fact supply the, de the demands of all of the haemophiliacs in Britain? No. What sort of proportion would it supply? It's a difficult question to answer. It would probably be around uh, half or a little more than half, perhaps. English plasma could be processed in Scotland now, but only if present policy is reversed. This rules that Edinburgh will not be used until Elstree reaches maximum output in 1977. More factor 8 concentrate could be made in Britain immediately if plasma could be provided faster. But because it was not considered a priority, English health authorities failed to plan for this. So the blood transfusion service had no money to provide sufficient equipment or staff to collect the extra plasma required. To overcome the problem, last January, Government Minister Dr David Owen allocated £500,000 to speed up plasma collection. We asked him how long it would take before Britain could stop being dependent on imported concentrates. Well, it can only be as fast as uh, buildings can be set up and uh, equipment purchased. Uh, when I made the decision now, uh, some time ago, um, it was thought that it would take us three years. We brought it down to two years, and maybe we can improve even on that. So we've already got 30% of supply now coming from the National Blood Transfusion Service. Do you yourself accept that paid donors, either in America or in other countries, are a greater health risk than volunteer British donors? Yes, I think all the evidence shows that this is the case because they have a commercial interest in not disqualifying themselves. And some of the questions that they're asked, have you had jaundice, things like this, would in fact disqualify you from having a transfusion and therefore you don't get paid. And that's one of the reasons why the, the donor source is an unreliable one under a commercial system. Do you think that it is acceptable, given that most experts agree that you can't detect more than a third of the virus that's present, that it, you should use a product of this nature? Well, you can, you will, we'll never be absolutely certain, even when we produce it ourselves. So there's always some risk. There's a risk from any form of uh, using blood from donors. But uh, you have to balance the risk. At the moment, in this country, we have not got full production facilities for our own. I would much prefer it, and the sooner we've got our own, the better. As soon as we've got our own and we're self-sufficient, then comes the question of whether it is reasonable to any longer rely on uh, provision from other countries. And I think that raises some profoundly important moral issues, as well as uh, the whole question of whether you're satisfied with their standards of um, safety. Imported concentrates are expensive. Each unit costs the British taxpayer 12p. One dose like this costs about £32. We buy from two American manufacturers, Baxter and Abbott. Both companies sell Factor 8 concentrates much cheaper in America. Three leading American hospitals told us they paid only 4p to 6.5p per unit, compared with 12p in Britain. Baxter said the difference was because the only plasma product it sold in Britain was Factor 8. Abbott denied that the prices we quoted were correct. The hospitals, however, confirmed them. World in Action revealed this large price difference to the Minister of State, Dr David Owen. Well, I think that's a quite disturbing fact, that we're paying more than we pay in the United States, and I'd like to look into this. This is one of the things that has emerged. Uh, there are, of course, extra costs. It's not unusual. Uh, our own drugs in this country are sold abroad in foreign countries at a higher cost, transport cost and everything like that. But uh, t double the cost does seem rather a lot. We'd have to look at that. We then put the same information to Dr William Maycock, the Department of Health's advisor on blood transfusion policy. Well, of this I wasn't aware until you had spoken, uh, until you put this question. Um, 
I don't know. I, I don't think I want to express any view on that. Making concentrates ourselves could save half a million pounds a year. The exact cost is uncertain, but one estimate is as low as 3p per unit. John Watt confirms the saving. Yes, it should be. It should be very much cheaper. Um, the, when the, the, all three centres are working to capacity, uh, we should have at least twice the, the production needs for the UK. And um, because of the conditions under which we have to work, it should be very much cheaper. Um, it would be difficult to ascribe um, finite costs at the moment, but I would have thought that we should get be able to produce at about a third to a half of the commercial cost. If we're not producing at less than half, I would suggest it's time we looked very closely at our methodology. In the last two years that we've been importing these concentrates, it's probably cost the National Health Service something close to a million pounds. Right. Do you not think that this money might not have been better spent in actually speeding up the availability of the plasma so that we could make the product ourselves? Well, I, I agree with you. I wouldn't have invested in uh, self-sufficiency in this country if I disagreed with you. I don't think that it was a question of providing more money. I was told, and I think this is right, that the limitation on our build-up is one of buildings, equipment, and to some extent getting clinicians used to using packed cell blood and having a larger volume. But um, I've tried to make this switch to self-sufficiency as quickly as possible, and I share some of your feelings that I wish it had been made uh, in 1971, 72, or even earlier than that. But the cost to Britain of importing factor eight concentrates isn't just a matter of money. The blood collecting business began in the poor countries of Central America in the 1960s. It spread through the impoverished Caribbean and South America. But in many countries, government opposition to this exploitation forced the plasma firms, mainly American, to look elsewhere for the millions of pounds worth of plasma they bought each year. They've been trying to gain footholds in West and Southern Africa, India, Indonesia and the Philippines. America was the biggest plasma buyer, but now Europe and Israel are the major customers due to tougher US health laws. Plasma from developing countries may be a hepatitis risk, but it's cheap and the products it makes are highly profitable. From Canada and Switzerland too, plasma brokers supply these and other countries. The World Health Organization and the Red Cross say the plasma traffic is all one way, the wrong way, from the poor countries to the rich countries. This is why they want it banned. I know of one Middle Eastern country where a haemophiliac patient may travel 300 miles and wait for several days outside the clinic looking for treatment. Uh, and it's not because the clinic doesn't want to take him in, because they, they don't have enough beds and they don't have enough material. Um, the factor eight isn't there. It's all gone to the more affluent parts of the world. Um, there's at least one country in Africa where they have no haemophilia problem at all in the sense that uh, it, haemophilia is not a medical problem in that country, presumably because the patients don't live long enough to constitute a medical problem. I think there's a very strong moral case for, once you are self-sufficient, ensuring that you only use your own national sources and freeing up those resources in other nations for their needs. Yes, I think there's a strong moral case. I think there's a strong commercial case. What is your view of this particular business of the world trade in plasma? I don't think I can uh, discuss that in television. It's, it will be cut out anyway. What do you think, therefore, of a country like Britain becoming involved in this business by importing factor eight concentrates? To put it mildly, I don't approve. As a direct result of our investigation, the British government is asking US health authorities to re-examine their controls on plasma centers. The Department of Health is looking into whether Britain is paying too much for imported concentrates. And in Washington, a Senate committee is pressuring Baxter to disclose how much its concentrates cost to make and where the plasma comes from. Um, so it's five past one. Um, and that would be a convenient point, I think, at which to break for lunch. We'll take a break until five past two. Five past two.